Good morning church and let me just say I hope you're all well on what of course is Palm Sunday and it, it seems like it could be a little while till we have a normal Palm Sunday service together. Obviously this year isn't going to be a normal service and if you remember back to last year Palm Sunday was when we had Erin's dedication and, and that, that was just a, a great day wasn't it? Steve and Jen brought all their friends and family filled the church. I think they had half of Scotland with them. Jen brought like a thousand sandwiches, if you remember. Me and Lauren are still eating those sandwiches to this day. There was so many leftovers. It was like the miracle of loaves and fishes that day. But um, that was Palm Sunday, and it was a great way to kick off Easter last year. This year will be a little bit different, but God willing, next year will be different again. But just because we're at home doesn't mean we can't continue to celebrate. So let me just read something to you from the, the Palm Sunday story. If you have your Bibles, I'll be looking at Mark 11, starting at verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a donkey there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here to me. Let me just skip forward a little bit to verse 7. When they brought the donkey to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it and sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches that they had cut in the fields. And those who went ahead shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in highest heaven. Like this, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went back out to Bethany with his twelve disciples. Amen. We'll stop there. All four Gospels have this, this story in them. And uh, it, it retells Jesus' triumphant entry one week before his crucifixion when the city of Jerusalem welcomed him like a king. And I don't know about you, but whenever I read this story, I always get a kind of Sunday school vibe. I don't know if it's just because it seems like a kind of classic one for kids, doesn't it? This story always makes it into the children's Bible. I think I think because there's a donkey in it. I think whenever a donkey turns up in the Bible, you're going to have Sunday school kids colouring in pictures of it, aren't you? Or cutting out palm leaves and waving them about. But this is so much more than just a kind of cutesy story that makes for good Sunday school material. Whenever you read this passage, and whenever you read it in the future, it's worth remembering that everything Jesus does here, he does on purpose. It's all deliberate. Everything he's doing, he's doing to send a message. You know, nowhere else in the four Gospels do we ever see Jesus riding on the back of an animal. Jesus was a walker. He spent three years walking around Israel. He, he walked everywhere. He even, he even walked on water. For goodness sake, you know, Jesus liked to, he liked to get his steps in, in a day. But here, we see him on his way to Jerusalem, but instead of going straight to Jerusalem, he goes to Bethany, spends a couple of days there, gets on a donkey, and for the last two miles between Bethany and to Jerusalem, he rides in, in a donkey. Why did Jesus do this? It was very deliberate, it was very intentional. Jesus was sending a message. He was painting a picture for the people in Jerusalem about what he was like, about the kind of king he would be, and, and he was sending them a message. It was a fulfilment of prophecy. It was very deliberate and very intentional, and it happened for a reason. And there's other things that happen in this as well, where, where Jesus really is just making a statement and and sometimes it's very easy to miss. And there's one in particular that I would like to just talk about today. And that is the fact that Jesus chose to enter Jerusalem from the east. He had come from the north. But before going straight to Jerusalem, he goes over to Bethany, the Mount of Olives, which was on the east, and makes his way in to Jerusalem via the eastern gate through the city to the eastern door in the temple and then when he gets to the temple after this big fanfare it says in Mark that he looks around and then goes back to Bethany. It almost seems as if he 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 goes to the trouble of coming in 
just for the sake of it and then he goes away again what's going on here what's this all about why is this so significant well to understand what, what I think is significant about this, we need to go back to some of the visions and some of the prophecies of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a prophet who served God in Israel during a very dark time in their history. Ezekiel was active at the time just before the exile to Babylon, just when Israel's wickedness was about to catch up with him. And then he was active throughout some of it. And he died during the Babylonian captivity. And and for Ezekiel, Ezekiel lived during that time when, when Israel's whole relationship with God was based on the covenant. God lived in the temple. That was, that was the way they understood it. God had made a covenant with the people of Israel. And the deal was that if, if you serve God and make him your only God and are faithful to him, then he will be with you. He will be in the land. He will bless the land and his glory will be in the temple. That was kind of the deal that the that, that Israelites had with God. But the Israelites broke that deal. They, they did worship other gods. They did turn their back on them. And because of that, God left them and brought punishment against them in the form of the Babylonian armies. And there, there are lots of people in the Old Testament who pick up on what happened with the Babylonians. But Ezekiel's the only person really who picks up on what happened when God left them. You know, there's a lot to be said about the physical punishment that took place, but only Ezekiel really seems to pick up on the spiritual punishment. And I just want to read a couple of passages from one of his visions. It's quite a long vision he has, so I'm only going to read highlights of it. But this was the beginning of Israel's punishment, the spiritual punishment that came on them. Ezekiel 10 verse 4. In a vision, Ezekiel sees this. The glory of the Lord rose from above the cherubim and moved out towards the threshold of the temple. The cloud filled the temple and the court was full of the radiance of the glory of the Lord. Sounds awesome. Verse 18. Then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. Verse 22. Then the cherubim, with the wheels beside them, spread their wings, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. The glory of the Lord went up from within the city and stopped above the mountain that is to the east of it, which is the Mount of Olives. So what's happening here? What's happening in this kind of strange vision that Ezekiel's had? Long before Israel's physical punishment, they, they experienced this, this kind of silent spiritual punishment where, where the glory of God, the presence of God that dwell in the Holy of Holies by the Ark of the Covenant behind the curtain, that assurance that God was with them. Ezekiel sees in this vision that the glory of God leaves the temple. The glory of God actually leaves from the place where he said he would reside with the people, moves through the temple, out the eastern door, through the city, out the eastern city door, and over and up the Mount of Olives. Ezekiel sees this vision where the presence and the glory of God just moves away from where he said he would be, from where he had been with them because of their sinfulness. And, and I just think that's quite chilling. I think that's quite scary, the notion that God might just, because we're just so bad one day, he might just leave us. Yeah, it reminds me of the story of Samson, who, who kept on sinning against God, and then he came under attack, and it said Samson tried to use his mighty strength, but he couldn't, because God had left him, and he didn't know. How scary is that, to think that God might leave us as Christians we have an assurance that he never will so so we often don't worry about that kind of stuff but what if he did that's what Ezekiel's telling them has happened here he's saying to them God has left I've seen him leave the building but there's more 31 chapters later almost at the end of his book Ezekiel picks this theme up again let me read that Ezekiel 43 verse 1 then the man brought me to the gate facing east again, 
and I saw the glory of God of Israel coming from the east. His voice was like the roar of rushing waters and the land was radiant with his glory. Verse 4, the glory of the Lord entered the temple through the gate facing to the east and the spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Wow, in the same way that Ezekiel saw the glory and the presence and the radiance of God coming out the temple and leaving Jerusalem and leaving Israel, going up the Mount of Olives. Now he's saying, I saw the presence of God returning from the east. I saw it coming back, God coming back to his people, God coming back to his house to take up residence and to fill the land with his glory. Ezekiel gives us a very clear picture that that the glory of God returns the same way that it left from the Mount of Olives in the east down into the eastern gate back into the temple where he said he would be. And my message this morning is that 600 years later I believe we see a fulfilment to this prophecy. Jesus Christ the Son of God, the the physical presence of God, the glory of God in the flesh stands upon the Mount of Olives facing Jerusalem. He gets on a donkey, he comes down the mountain, enters the eastern gate, goes into the temple and once again the presence and the glory of God is back within the temple, only this time very much in the flesh. What a thought. What a thought that perhaps what we're seeing here in this triumphant entry isn't just Jesus being welcomed as a king. What if it is actually a fulfilment to prophecy? What if what if Jesus is actually a physical manifestation of the glory of God returning to the temple that he left six hundred years earlier? What if this is a what if this is a, a demonstration by Jesus Christ? You remember what Mark said? He got to the temple, he looked around, and then he went back to Bethany. It seems as if Jesus came through all this, done all this, just for the sake of doing it. He, he, he went from the Mount of Olives through the Eastern Gate into the temple just for the sake of making that journey. What if... Jesus was the physical manifestation, the fulfilment of Ezekiel's 600 year old prophecy that the glory of God would return from the east down the Mount of Olives and back in to the temple where he wanted to be, where he belonged. That's a thought, isn't it? And then what happened? Five days later, on the very first Good Friday, Jesus Christ died on a cross outside Jerusalem in the curtain in the temple that separated God who was in the Holy of Holies from mankind who was out was torn in two. The curtain was torn, opening the way for us to go in to where God was, opening the way for God to come to where we were. You know, the curtain being torn in two, the opening of the way between us and God only really makes sense if God was behind that curtain. But Ezekiel tells us, that the glory had left the temple. But what if it had come back? What if Jesus Christ had demonstrated a return of God's power and God's presence and God's glory to the temple just so that in five days' time when Jesus died on the cross, that curtain could be torn? What if Jesus brought God's presence and glory back to the temple just so that he could tear the curtain and make a way for us to move into it. Just a thought. At this time, church, there's an awful lot going on and so many people are starting to think and dwelling upon what they're losing. Coronavirus is costing us so much, isn't it? Some people are losing work, some people are losing losing loved ones, we're losing a sense of freedom, losing a sense of connection. It seems like it just every week takes more away from us. But can I encourage you this Easter, 
don't focus your mind on what the things of the world are taking away from you. Instead, this Easter, focus your mind on what Jesus Christ has come to give you. Just like Jesus Christ took that route through that eastern gate, a physical a physical fulfilment of the glory of God's returning. Just like that, Jesus has come into your life to bring you something, to bring you forgiveness, to bring you restoration and the redemption, and to bring you the glory and the presence of God Almighty. This Easter, focus on what God has for you, which has been brought to you by Jesus Christ. Let me just pray. Father, we just thank you for this time of year, your Easter story, God, and we thank you that you sent Jesus to bring us stuff. We, we could talk for a very long time on what Jesus has brought into our lives, but God, above all, he has brought you. He has made the way back to you this morning, God. And whatever it is you have for us, whatever it is you want us to receive, Lord, we say yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed Church, amen, and I hope you have a good Holy Week.